Hey everyone and welcome back to another vivarium demonstration. In this video I will show you how I set up another naturalistic bioactive vivarium for my crested gecko Henry. Without any delay, let's get into the build. To begin we'll start by making some removable backgrounds. Here I have some panels of 3 quarter inch thick styrofoam. As is, these pieces aren't the right size for what I want to do, so I cut them down a bit. Using gel super glue and clamps, I attach two pieces of foam together like so. After letting the glue dry, I removed the clamps. From there I made a measurement and cut the foam down to size. Then I repeated the same process two more times. If you've never done this before, I recommend getting foam that's the right size to begin with. As I do with most of my builds, I use materials that I already have. So in this case, it was necessary to prepare the foam as such. Next, it was time to prepare the hardscape elements for the background. I grabbed a large core crown and broke it into two pieces. Then I set a piece of bark on the styrofoam to ensure it was sized correctly. Using a series of different drill bits, I created holes throughout the cork to create a more naturalistic look. This will also allow the gecko to have more access points into the cork if it feels threatened. With the main piece of cork addressed, I moved on to preparing the back panel of foam. First I marked the sides with a piece of foam so that I knew where the other panels would touch. Then I got a drill bit with a 3 8 inch drill bit and made holes all throughout the piece of foam. These holes don't need to go all the way through the foam, just enough to create an uneven surface. Doing so will give the expanding foam a better surface to adhere to. Next I got a piece of cocoa husk liner and the cork. Using the cork as a guide, I cut out the piece of liner accordingly. Then I got a few smaller pieces of cocoa husk liner and marked for them on the foam, along with the original piece. I set these elements aside and applied 100% silicone in their place. Afterward, I pressed the pieces of cocoa husk liner firmly onto the silicone. From there, I set the pieces of cork bark in their respective locations. Then I prepped the side panels the same way. After getting the placement of all of the elements down, I went back and attached cocoa husk liner to the foam like before. Then I placed several planters in appropriate locations throughout the background. Next I began to apply the expanding foam. You can use various types of expanding foam, but in this case I'm using Great Stuff Pond and Stone Expanding Foam. Although this one is a little more expensive, it tends to be easier to use. As you're applying the foam, keep in mind that it does expand, so you might not need to apply as much as you would probably think. That said, I tend to overdo it. Although this may be a waste of materials, I prefer to over apply so that I can carve more later on. After applying all of the foam, it was time to let it cure. Now let's carve out the backgrounds. For this process, I use a razor blade scraper. You can use various tools for this process, but I prefer to use a scraper because it cuts the foam in a way that minimizes the mess. What I mean is that it doesn't create a bunch of small debris like a serrated knife would. You'll notice that any uncarved foam is shiny. This is important to recognize because silicone won't readily stick to it in this state. So when carving the foam, make sure to at least remove this layer.
After a little carving, you should end up with something like this. You may wonder why I removed all of the foam on the edges. If you remember, I measured for the side panels earlier. If I were to leave the expanding foam in these locations, the side panels wouldn't properly fit into the enclosure later on. From here, I proceeded to carve out the two side panels just like before. With the foam all carved out, it's time to apply the silicone. To do so, I simply apply a little silicone and paint it smooth with a paintbrush. I like to do it this way because it keeps it clean and disperses the silicone evenly. With a large background like this, I recommend doing it in sections. That said, after getting just a portion of the foam covered in silicone, the decorative elements could be added. First I dropped down a few pieces of orchid bark and then firmly pressed a handful of dry cocoa fiber onto the silicone. It's extremely important that the cocoa fiber is completely dry, otherwise whatever moisture is present will cause the silicone to cure prematurely. If this happens, then the cocoa fiber won't adhere properly to the silicone and it will likely fall off the background in no time. With the cocoa fiber pressed firmly into the silicone, the entire panel can then be flipped over to remove any excess. I recommend doing this over a discard pile, so that way you can keep reusing the same cocoa fiber. Doing a little bit at a time, I gradually build up a layer of orchid bark and cocoa fiber on the expanding foam using silicone. If you miss a spot here or there, it's not a big deal. You can always touch it up as you go or later on. An advantage to making the background out of the enclosure like this is that it's much easier to carve details on the foam and to apply the cocoa fiber. Using the same methods, I proceeded to cover the other two panels. If you want to learn how to make other naturalistic backgrounds, be sure to follow the link or check out the video description. After letting the background dry overnight, it was time to put them into the enclosure. To do so, I flipped the enclosure upside down and set the back panel in place. Next, I put the side panels into their respective locations. Individually, these panels wouldn't stay in place. However, as a collective unit, they apply pressure on one another and stay firmly secured. And if at any time I wanted to remove the background panels, I could easily do so since they aren't actually attached to the enclosure itself. From here, I tipped the enclosure back to its upright position and vacuumed any excess debris. To complete the overall aesthetic, I went back and siliconed pieces of sphagnum moss onto the background. To finalize the background completely, I drilled holes into the bottoms of the planters. This will keep stagnant water from building up, which could harm the plants. In retrospect, I should have done this before putting the backgrounds into the enclosure, but I didn't feel like going through the hassle of it. Now we'll move on to the false bottom layer. For this vivarium, I'm going to make an egg crate false bottom. I've shown this many times in the past, so to remove redundancy, I already have the sections of the egg crate cut to size. These pieces were simply attached together using some zip ties. After combining all of the pieces together, I snipped the zip ties clean. Then I grabbed a roll of carbon fiberglass window screen mesh. I've said it many times before, but please do not use any form of metal screen for this process. Under these types of conditions, the metal will quickly corrode or rust and eventually ruin your vivarium. With my mesh selected, I cut out a piece slightly larger than the egg crate and then attached it using some zip ties. Thank you. 
After getting all of the zip ties in place, I snipped them clean and removed a little bit of the excess screen. It's important not to remove all of it though. You want some excess to curl outward like so. Next I got a bag of Leica clay pellets. I prefer to use the ones from Ikea here because they are cheaper by volume than most alternatives and they are the same thing. From here I dumped the Leica into a bucket and soaked them in dechlorinated water for about a half hour. This will clean them off a bit and allow them to absorb some moisture. This is important to note because it will make it easier to achieve and retain a high humidity later on. So I removed one of the background panels and vacuumed out the debris. Then I placed the egg crate portion of the false bottom into the enclosure. While doing so, I made sure that the excess mesh didn't curl under the egg crate. Next I filled the void between the egg crate and the sides of the enclosure with Leica. Finally I got another sheet of window screen mesh and covered the entire bottom of the enclosure. If you notice it's slightly larger than the area I'm working with. This is important because when we put the substrate into the enclosure, it will actually press the mesh up against the sides of the enclosure, preventing the substrate from getting down into the rest of the false bottom. Now let's mix up the substrate. To start we'll prepare the charcoal. Any sort of lump wood or horticultural charcoal will work just fine. You could break it up into smaller pieces as is, but I'll show you something a little better. That said, I dumped the charcoal into a large bucket and filled it up with some water. You'll notice that I put Reptile Safe drops in as I filled the bucket. This is important because the charcoal will absorb some water. However, we don't want the charcoal absorbing any chlorine, so a little dechlorinator will do the job. After letting the charcoal soak for a good half hour, I placed it into a different container. Then, using a splitting maul, I smashed the charcoal into smaller, more manageable pieces. This is where soaking the charcoal comes into play. Had we smashed dry charcoal, it would have released soot all throughout the air. Therefore, this method is not only cleaner, but it's safer as well. With the charcoal prepared, we'll move on. Here I'm mixing up my standard ABG substrate mix. First, I started out with some cocoa fiber. Then I added some sphagnum moss. I will say that I tend to gravitate towards cheap sphagnum moss because I like that it has twigs mixed into it, but you could use whatever you want. After mixing these together, I added some orchid bark. I then mixed in some charcoal from earlier. Finally, I added some sand. If you want a full demonstration or more information on how I make this, follow the link or check out the video description. You may be wondering why I didn't measure the things that I was using. Well, I've made this so many times that I know how it should look and feel, so I don't bother following my proportions. It's kind of like cooking, once you've done it so much, you just know how to add the ingredients without measuring. Now that our substrate is completely mixed up, we can add it into the enclosure. To start we'll lay down a generous layer of charcoal. This layer will do many things, but most importantly it will inhibit mold growth and provide a home for our springtails. That said, we'll add two established cultures of springtails into the charcoal layer. When making a bioactive vivarium, I think this is the best method to seed the enclosure with springtails. I say that because the established cultures not only have an abundance of springtails, but the charcoal from those colonies are also covered in eggs. Since springtails will largely reside in the charcoal layer, seeding this way will jumpstart the entire process and get you a more substantial colony in a shorter amount of time. Now we'll add a generous layer of substrate. When adding this layer, I recommend making it much thicker in the back and slope it downward toward the front. This helps when planting background plants and creates a greater sense of depth. With the vivarium ready for the next step, we'll prepare the plants for use. A lot of people like to prepare their plants in different ways, but the beginning steps are all pretty much the same. Let's start by removing as much dirt as we possibly can from the roots of the plants. 
If any pests are present, this is likely where they will be hiding out, unless it's something like scale. After removing as much dirt as possible, let's thoroughly wash the plants with some warm water. In doing so, gently rub the roots of the plants to remove excess dirt. Also rub the leaves with your fingers to remove any chemicals that could be present, such as insecticides. From here, a lot of people like to use a diluted bleach or hydrogen peroxide mixture to clean the plants even further. Although it never hurts to be more thorough, I think it's a bit overkill. However, if that's what you prefer to do, I completely understand. In my opinion, if you're thorough enough with the process I just showed, you can get the plants clean enough for use. However, I should say that after rinsing the plants, I highly recommend putting them in quarantine for at least a month, especially if they are going into an established vivarium. This will allow the plant to gradually acclimate to the conditions that you will provide, and you can monitor for pests or other issues. That way, if any issues pop up, you can address them in a controlled environment rather than in the enclosure itself. However, in this instance, I don't have the space to put these plants in quarantine, so they will have to go right into the vivarium. With that in mind, I'm not going to put my gecko into this setup for at least a month. From here, we're in the home stretch. Let's start setting up and planting the enclosure. To start, I have some flexible jungle vines. I could have made something like this myself, but I didn't feel like dealing with it at the time. Using two different vines, I created a design that I thought looked natural and that would work well for my crested gecko. Before we start adding the plants, I'll show you what I have here. Here I have some zinc wire. I'm going to use sections of this to pin various plants to the background. The reason why you want to use zinc wire is that it won't corrode or rust and will last long term in the vivarium without creating any issues. Now let's add some plants. I started by placing java moss on the vine. Then I put some substrate in one of the planters and planted a Cryptanthus black mystic. After getting it situated, I added some more java moss. Next, I attached a Neo Regalia fireball to the background. From there I added a Bilbergia TL Mead and a Syngonium Podophyllum Renor to the other side. Then I put some Java Moss in the same place. Next I attached some Cryptbergia Rubra to the back side of the formation using the zinc wires I showed earlier. Then I added a Neo Regalia Tiger to the same side. Another section of Syngonium Podophyllum Renor and a Cryptanthus Acalis Jade were then planted into the ground. Some cuttings of Wandering Jew Purple were then added to the planter on the background. From there, I added a mini prayer plant and a Cryptanthus snow goose to the right side of the vivarium. Next, I added a parlor palm to the left side to fill in some space. Then, I planted a Syngonium Podophyllum Regina Red in front of the parlor palm. After that, I added a few sections of Golden Pothos and Photonia Red Vein to various locations within the Vivarium. From there, I planted more Parlor Palm.
Next, I added a few segments of Calathea Gold Mosaic from Henry's current Vivarium. He seems to like this plant a lot, so I wanted to include it in this setup as well. Next, I proceeded to pin some Ficus Primula Corsifolia to the left side of the background, and then I pinned some standard Ficus Primula to the right side of the background. Finally, I added an unnamed Philodendron to the top right. From here, it was time to add the isopods. Much like the springtails, I like to add leaves and substrate from my existing isopod culture since it's already colonized. In turn, this will make it much easier to get a larger colony of isopods to establish in the vivarium itself. After adding the isopods, I put down a layer of leaf litter consisting of magnolia and oak leaves. I like to use a combination of leaves because it creates a more natural look. From there, I gave the leaf litter a good spray down. Next, I added several patches of live sphagnum moss and java moss. Last but not least, I gave the vivarium a final spray down. Here is the final product. Overall, I really like how it turned out, but it has a lot of growing in to do. Once this vivarium becomes established, it's going to look like a mini jungle with a dense canopy. That in mind, I recommend letting your vivarium establish for a month or two prior to adding your animals. You will have much more success with your plants if you let them root and become established in their new environment prior to the animals crawling all over them, especially something a little larger like a crested gecko. Also, waiting a little bit will allow your cleanup crew to populate, and as a result they will be more efficient in doing their job once the animal is introduced. You may be wondering what the specs are on this vivarium, but I will talk about that in part 2 of this series when we put Henry in his new home. You may have noticed that I have another vivarium to the left of this one. That's another bioactive vivarium for my crested gecko Delilah. Don't worry, I'll release a different type of video series on that one as well. In the meantime, we'll let this vivarium do its thing. Henry will likely be added in mid-April or so. Anyways, that concludes this demonstration. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something useful for your next Vivarium build. If you want to see project sneak peeks or updates on my animals, be sure to follow me on Instagram. Also, if you wouldn't mind giving this a thumbs up, it would mean a lot. Anyways, I greatly appreciate you guys, and I'll see you next time.